All right, so starting then. All right, so welcome. So let's see. <clears throat> Let me. Is this working? I don't think this is working. Hmm. Left and right. Hmm. Is it on? Okay. I see the lights. Okay. Okay. So, a little bit about myself then. So, I'm a software developer and systems administrator. Okay. I mostly focused on. Yeah? Okay. Right. So I'm mostly focused on uh, Linux and free software. I actually long worked for a company that makes an open source product. So, yeah, I'm quite dedicated. Uh, I work in desktop virtualization. Basically, we do remote desktops for, for people. It's a consulting company. So, uh, you probably wouldn't have heard of it anyway. I joined Second Life uh, something like 17 years ago. It's uh, kind of a uh, the prototype for kind of what we're trying to do. And uh, back when they open sourced uh, the client code for it, I was one of the first third party developers for, for Second Life before I moved on to different projects. And well, Second Life unfortunately is kind of uh, stagnating technologically because I think one of uh, first the server part is closed source, so you can't do anything with it. You can only change the client. And second, it's heavily used user built, so that means that you can't really um, modify much of it without uh, stepping on somebody's toes. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of the problem they are struggling with. There's a lot of user content built in, even by dead people at this point. And well, if you touch something relating to the engine, you might actually break something that nobody can fix anymore. So they kind of have this tricky problem. Uh, I also used to be a, a core team of Vircadia, which is kind of the predecessor of uh, my project. Uh, I will explain that shortly. And I'm the current chairman of over the EV. Basically, we registered a non-profit for our organization to hold assets and manage development. And so we used to call this metaverse. Now, thanks to Facebook, this is kind of an kind of icky word. So you probably won't hear that much in our Discord anymore. Uh, but yeah, that's kind of uh, the idea of a virtual environment where you can mostly do anything you want. Yeah. So, so what do we have? We have a 3D environment with VR support, including on Linux. Uh, we also support desktop mode, so it just runs like a perfectly normal application. Uh, we have avatars, of course, with legs, unlike Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, multi-user, of course. It can be modified at runtime, so it's not a thing where you kind of uh, work uh, uh, entirely with it. Uh, some editor and then upload everything at once. It's scriptable. Uh, we use JavaScript and are in process of upgrading to V8, which is the engine that Chrome uses. Uh, it has a web-like architecture. By this, I mean that we, it's, more, it's kind of in concept like a 3D version of Apache. You set up your own server. Uh, it, the server has um, a data structure that links to assets. You just go there and load that. So. And that will, I think that will be, become clearer in a little bit. And yeah, you can do anything you like with it. It's, um, it's under the Apache license. So uh, you can do whatever you want. You, of course, if you do certain things, we might uh, uh, pretend we don't know, know anything about you. But yeah. Uh, so, so, so far, no, nobody has actually done anything suspicious, just in case you're wondering. But yeah. Possibility always exists because in Second Life, yeah, it's it's happened. Yeah, Apache to license, uh, similar examples, kind of similar. Uh, Second Life, VR Chat, Neos VR. Uh, a lot of those, by the way, are closed source. So 
Uh, Second Life has an open client part, but yeah. So what we aren't? Uh, we aren't focused on money. So we are not, not a company, we are an association. Uh, we aren't a business. We don't try to sell you stuff. Uh, we aren't anything related to the blockchain. So the metaverse thing, thanks to Facebook and some other kind of unsavory organizations, uh, these days kind of got this association that is there's going to be cryptocurrency and so on. Uh, the Arcadia went that way, which is why some history happened. Uh, we, yeah, we don't sell land or NFTs or anything of that kind. Uh, and also we aren't agreed. So what do I mean by that? So uh, here's for instance, in a Second Life, uh, when you first download a Second Life client, what do you get? Well, okay, you get this. So uh, it, it asks you for a login. Without logging in, you can't get anywhere in Second Life. So if you happen to get on the wrong side of an administrator, you'll be excluded from the entire system. We're not like that. We have authentication, but more in the way that Apache has authentication. A, pay, a website can ask you for a login, but uh, there is no uh, uh, such thing as in login to the Apache universe. right? So. Uh, we can, for instance, if you misbehave, we can certainly remove you from our uh, environments, which you use for the community, like the, our uh, main spaces. But you can remain in the world, and you can still hang out with whoever you used to hang out before. So, yeah, we don't have this kind of tight paywall in, in front of the entire uh, setting. All right. So let me try. Uh, let me see if I can quickly get it running here. Uh, uh, let's see. I'll try and see if I can. Well, I'll just do stop. Yeah. Click. Kick. Yeah. Let me see if, if this should load. So yeah, loading. Uh, wait, I think. Oops. Give me a second. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. So I should be here. There we go. So yeah, this is what we call a serverless domain, and basically. It's a chunk of JSON on the user's hard disk, so you don't need to connect to anything. So yeah, I don't need an internet connection. So yeah, uh, it's a bit uncomfortable to control like this. So yeah, I'll leave a proper de demonstration for later. And yeah, we have a nice 3D environment. We have, yeah, that's my other All right. Should be loading by now. Uh, okay. There we go, a random avatar. This was, uh, I think, we discussed there and forced them, so yeah. So let's see, uh, just play selfie. Okay, so getting back to the presentation. Where's my mouse? Ah, oh, yeah, okay, here it is. Oops, I think I reset it. Okay, give me a second. Da, da, da. Why is this not working? Okay, so what can, can you do with this? Also, share things like hanging out, meetings, simple games events, most anything you like. So this technology has been used in the past for holding conferences. It's uh, been used for simple gaming. Uh, 
I think uh, as soon as we have a uh, big upgrade complete, we'll have kind of much better capability for that sort of thing. Um, yeah, it's uh, been kind of uh, used to hold parties and events, and you, know, you, you can uh, uh, do anything you like with it. So, yeah. right. So, where does this come from? So, it started with uh, this man of remarkable fashion sense. So, yeah, that's Philip Rosedale, and way back. So let's see, timeline. In 1999, he founded a company called Linden Research. And they actually, way back then, wanted to create VR headsets. So they actually were into VR before it actually became a modern thing. And so they started Linden Research. And this thing doesn't work very well. Uh, in 2003, they released Second Life. So they actually started with a prototype headset, and according to rumors, it's still lost in a basement somewhere. Uh, but uh, for to use the, the, their VR hardware, they actually needed software. And for that, they made Second Life. And actually, the hardware didn't go anywhere. Uh, but Second Life is still uh, exists, and is still fairly successful, I'd say. Right. So Second Life keeps existing for a good while until Philip uh, um, decided to do something different and step down. The company still exists, so just managed by different people. And yeah, in 2012, uh, the new uh, company Philip created uh, made its first commit to the Git repo we, we have. And uh, the Oculus Kickstarter also happened in 2012. So you can see how back, way back, they actually were trying to do VR. It actually took more than a decade uh, to actually get, get it uh, going. All right. So, yeah. Uh, so Philip created a company called, Confu very confusingly, High Fidelity, which sounds like an audio thing, uh, but it was a 3D environment. And for a long time, this works like, like half the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. They tried uh, to basically build Second Life 2.0. They actually have a much more modern code base. And I do remember that uh, I actually noticed their existence uh, fairly early on. And they would uh, hold virtual parties and hand out uh, free money, but yeah, didn't quite succeed with it. So 2016, we have the Oculus Rift CV1, which is basically kind of the sta start of modern uh, uh, user-friendly VR. And in 2019, finally, High Fidelity gave up and decided to do something like virtual meetings. So and they kind of uh, refocused to corporate uh, uh, services. Uh, the community back then, of course, was quite upset with it. And uh, yeah, not very happy with that. All right. So, uh, by the end of 2019, uh, High Fidelity announces uh, it's going to shut down. Well, uh, here's an interesting thing. Uh, Philly, uh, High Fidelity created something I've never quite seen before, which is uh, a product that was almost impossible to make money from. And for some reason, they did it anyway. So it's a radically open system. It's uh, under the Apache license. It's uh, open, uh, all of it is open. We, uh, we have uh, the code for the client, for the server, even for the tests, a uh, bunch of uh, kind of uh, experiments, support for uh, interesting kind of experimental hardware that didn't quite succeed in the end. All of that is there. Uh, there are no strings attached. Uh, there's no kind of main login screen in the main part of it. So yeah, uh, you could just 
take it and do whatever you want. Uh, back when high fidelity, the original one was still a thing, uh, you could just uh, download the source from GitHub and build your own company on it if you wanted. That was uh, entirely legal. That's, uh, yeah, they actually had something like 75 million worth of investment. And yeah, in the end, it, it didn't quite work. Bec right. So at around this, uh, this time, they gave up. Uh, so, of course, uh, back then there was a small but uh, very kind of high, uh, active uh, user community. And uh, people inter immediately started thinking, well, okay, what do we do now? Uh, can we take over? So, uh, this, uh, this resulted in Project Athena, which uh, uh, later was renamed Vercadia. And I was a uh, part of that as well. I was on the main team doing that. Uh, shortly afterwards, there's the new high fidelity. So yeah, high fidelity still exists, and now it's a completely different thing. Before, it was a 3D environment, like you've seen. Now, it runs in the browser. It's completely 2D, and it's basically like Zoom, where you can, uh, like the audio Zoom, but you just can move around. Like, you have a little icon, and you can just move it around the screen. And so you, you can just kind of uh, move, uh, people can just kind of move in clusters so that, that you can have some, for instance, three people move out to the side and have a conversation with somebody else without actually having to create rooms and things like that. It's, it's, it's also called new high fidelity? No, it's just high fidelity. So basically, there's the old high fidelity and the new high fidelity. Yeah, there are two different projects under the same name. Yeah, because mm -hmm. this app you were describing, I, 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 I saw something with a different name exactly doing that. Yes, yes. More than one thing around. Yeah, yeah. Stuff, no? Yeah, yeah. They, they used to uh, reuse the, the name for a completely different project, basically. It's confusing, but yeah. I'm just pointing it out because if you look for high fidelity now, you're going to run an in. You look, you're going to see the web browser one. I'll see after the talk if I can quickly uh, open the page and uh, yeah, show what it looks like. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, uh, so Vergadia yeah, actually uh, uh, went on for a while, but unfortunately there were a few tensions regarding the direction of the develop development and management and so on. Well, uh, um, so over the split of Vergadia, yeah, and basically most of the actual active contributors went to Overte. So Vergadia uh, now is something quite different from what it started. So, uh, yeah, what's the deal with that? Uh, so, Verte is basically a bunch of dissatisfied people from Vircadia, for the most part, uh, and other people that joined afterwards. And I would say that is, uh, most of the main contributors that actually did anything on it. Vircadia uh, uh, basically started uh, uh, considering uh, projects uh, related to cryptocurrency, which upset quite a lot of people, or it actually rejects cryptocurrency. I mean, you can still do it because, I mean, uh, we, uh, our license allows doing anything you want with the code, uh, but just don't really expect uh, people to help you very much in uh, with that sort of thing. Uh, or it is a non-profit. It's uh, an uh, official organization. It's registered in Germany. Uh, Vercadia also exists, a com uh, has a company that supports it, but has much more commercial ambitions. It, uh, uh, they're currently working with some sort of uh, uh, cryptocurrency providers. Uh, come on. Yeah. Uh, Overte is also a democratic uh, association. We have yearly elections. And uh, we are, in a way, we are keeping the desktop client, but Vercadia is actually deprecating it and switching to a, uh, to a, a 3D, but web-based interface, uh, which is, I would say, is, is still more or less in alpha. The code so far remains mostly compatible, so we can actually, come on. Hmm. This. Hey. 
<laughs> okay. Right. And Wikid also includes a non free component, which I think is, uh, is probably relevant for, for Debian. It, uh, it's an audio codec. It's actually a quite impressive one. Uh, the high fidelity people came out with an excellent codec, which is uh, fairly high bandwidth, but very low CPU usage, which is exactly what you want if you want to get 500 people in, into the same environment. We can't use that. Uh, it's not free. And it doesn't, doesn't even have a license. Basically, Virgilia has permission to use it from, the, from what remains of the high fidelity complaint. Uh, we replaced it with Opus, which is a perfectly fine uh, codec, but just a bit uh, uh, CPU hungry. All right, so summing up, uh, yeah, uh, what we have is a continuation of the old high fidelity, which used to be a commercial project, but is now community managed. Uh, it uh, has a more or less 10 year old history at this point. This thing is annoying. Yeah, it's a pretty big project. And it was, I don't get this thing. <laughs> yeah, and it's now being developed by a group of volunteers. Okay, so, uh, so here, uh, I think a logical question to ask is kind of what wrong with high fidelity? Like, uh, I mean, if uh, maybe it failed because well, the technology just just wasn't good. Well, uh, in my opinion, it's uh, basically because they kind of uh, did made the wrong thing. They made it actually so open, it was uh, almost impossible to make a business on it. It was like a, a company uh, got, got together, got an investment of something somewhere around 75 million, and then uh, uh, proceeded to do the most anti-corporate project I've ever seen. Uh, like they almost ensured that they couldn't lock anything down and uh, almost make money from it. Uh, I think uh, they also seem to be a bit uh, indec indecisive about actually how they wanted to make money. Because while it was still alive, you couldn't really pay them for anything. So, uh, in my opinion, kind of uh, the most lo logical uh, options for it would be either be an open source company, which is kind of uh, do consulting, like here's the code. The, you, you want some modification for your particular co company or you want support for your conference, we'll come to us, we'll figure it out, and we'll do custom coding for you. That would be one option. The other one, is option that would be viable, it would be more like Second Life, have it more closed, more of a walled garden where you have to pay to get in or are taxed for whatever you do in there. Hmm. Okay, so uh, what is the technology like? So here is more or less a diagram of what it looks like. Here we have the client. Uh, the, the general thing you, you talk to, basically the main server, is in this termi uh, terminology called a domain server. And the domain server is, mo is made of uh, seven different pieces. Those are actually individual uh, uh, processes that can run independently. And they don't actually need to run on the same machine which is, uh, I think, a very interesting part of the infrastructure. So, for instance, uh, here's the audio mixer. So, if for whatever reason your <laughs> audio mixer crashes, uh, like it just sec faults, everyone just loses audio service, but everyone remains where they were. Just nobody can talk. You reboot it, and things keep going. Uh, you can also move any of these to a different machine. So, for instance, if uh, you have a small environment and suddenly 500 people want to show up, you can just go to on Amazon, you or Linode or DigitalOcean, you just uh, start a machine, run uh, the audio mixer on there, and just move it over. We actually have a script which can do 
uh, the switchover in about a second or two. So yeah, when things start getting getting busy, uh, script just detects that the load is getting high, starts uh, launching a second virtual machine, and once it's there, it just moves over the audio server. So yeah, w while people are having a conference or whatever, you can just uh, expand the capability of the system and you can shrink it back down afterwards by just doing the reverse process. Okay, so what do we have? Uh, we have a scripting service. Uh, we have the main kind of agent service, which is basically an, uh, oh, uh, an avatar. We have the message mixer, which is uh, ju just passes messages in between people and things. So things like chat messages or communication in between scripts. Uh, there's the audio mixer, which is uh, creates positional audio. Uh, the audio is mixed on the server and delivered to the client. Uh, there's the avatar mixer, which is uh, what uh, keeps track of who is where. Uh, there's the entity server, uh, which is uh, basically the objects that are present inside the world. And there's the asset server, which is like a little yeah, uh, HTTP server, for instance, that delivers assets to people. Uh, the asset server is actually an optional part. Uh, you can use it, or you can just uh, upload stuff to any HTTP server you want. All right. Uh, okay. So technology. So we have a fully distributed, scalable virtual world. Uh, it supports Oculus Rift, CMDR, Windows MR. At position audio, it runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Mac currently needs work, unfortunately, because, well, Mac, in their wisdom, so it uh, decided to deprecate OpenGL, basically. So, yeah, that's a bit of a tricky one. Hmm. There is very experimental support in the code for Android and Oculus Quest. Unfortunately, we're currently lacking in Android developers, so if anybody is interested, we'll be very interested. Uh, it's written in C++, a pretty modern one, a Qt5, and JavaScript. Uh, yeah, everything can be scripted in JavaScript, both client-side and server-side. Uh, the code has a highly modular architecture. Uh, major parts of the, uh, like the rendering engine, are abstracted and can actually be swapped out. Yeah, uh, heavily multi-threaded. It uh, actually uh, fits very well on modern CPUs and it's portable. Yeah, it has a custom. Uh, 3D engine, and it actually looks quite good. Supports OpenGL. Yeah. Uh, the audio engine has positional audio, audio zones. So that's, a, that's actually a very cool feature for things like conferences, which is we can uh, uh, change how the audio works in different parts of the environment. So for instance, uh, you can make that somebody standing on a stage broadcasts to, to the entire world. Or if you step off to the back, things get quiet, uh, things like that. Hmm. Uh, it can negotiate compression. It supports MIDI. We actually ha have a platform that's very fitting for music events. Yeah. Uh, it supports streaming, including in stereo. All right, scripting engine. Uh, it's uh, JavaScript. It's based on Qt script, uh, which is part of Qt. Uh, for, uh, it has been deprecated in the current Qt, but it's still current in Qt5. So we are replacing it v with V8. V8 is basically what uh, you have in Chrome. So it's going to be a very modern engine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a big project, still ongoing, but we are getting very close. We actually have our working prototype right now. Okay. Uh, it has access to pretty much everything up to rearranging the actual user interface of the, of the thing. It, it's easy to expand, so like if you're missing some sort of API, we can definitely do that. And yeah, it's available everywhere, so 
it's uh, you can skip the interface, the client side, and the and the server side. Okay, there's a physics uh, engine. It's based on Bullet, and it has an interesting feature that's automatically dis distributed. So basically, the server actually uh, hands out chunks of the world to random people to simulate. Uh, it's a bit of a quirky thing. We are uh, considering different options uh, because, yeah, it's uh, very good for messing around, but it has some downsides if you want consistency, like in a game, because things can kind of be a little, a little bit janky once in a while. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Point where? Yeah. Is it? No, it's connected to the computer. Yeah, no, I. Okay. Okay. So, well, we have an organization. It's uh, called Overte EV, and it's regist registered in Germany as a non profit. That actually took quite a lot of work. Uh, uh, we were inspired by KDE, so we are the same kind of organization as KDE is. So yeah, I'm the official ch chairman of the organization. Uh, we have a board, and it actually includes an empty seat because we left the provision for another member, just in case uh, another uh, person comes, comes up. Uh, <coughs> And we hold an assembly once uh, once a year, which can be in the virtual world. Yeah. All right. We have many contributors and uh, content creators that uh, contributed to making it what it is. Okay. So, so uh, we've set up uh, an official association and based in Germany. That actually took a little bit of uh, quite a lot of work because we actually have uh, quite an international team. We have uh, pe uh, people in Germany, in Spain, in Finland. So, yeah, uh, we had to do a little bit of branding, community develop uh, management, development, events. So we hold regular in-world meetings. We have a matrix on Discord. Uh, we do code reviews and uh, QA. All right. Yeah, and we've been making many many improvements to uh, what we started with. Uh, there's been improved Linux support, uh, improved UI, renderer, uh, voxels. Uh, voxels very actually an uh, kind of uh, this is sort of like basically like Minecraft. It was an unfinished uh, part of the high fidelity system. We actually had to debug it a little bit and now it's actually looking very good. Uh, audio mixer, VR support, GLTF. Uh, so yeah, a lot of stuff. All right, so uh, we have many plans. So QT upgrade. We are right now on Qt5. Qt5 is basically end of life. It's uh, being supported still, uh, but it's been replaced by Qt6. Uh, this re requires that we replace the scripting engine. This is in progress, and it's actually going very well. Uh, we are at the point where it pretty much runs. Uh, there are improvements to the audio engine, uh, improvements to the audio encoding also. Uh, one of the things we're considering is actually supporting flag for streaming, which is kind of weird, but uh, Opus is kind of uh, CPU intensive. Basically, flag would be an option for low CPU usage, but high bandwidth option for the times that where that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Uh, screen sharing right now is a little bit complicated, so we need to, to improve that. And we need to improve asset management, right? So, uh, second uh, things like Second Life and VRChat, they kind of have a central system, right? So, 
when you connect to Second Life, you just upload stuff to it. So if you just connect, it doesn't go anywhere. In our case, it's uh, all hosted on basically random, random servers. So if I take my server down, all my stuff disappears with it. So yeah, basically we need to, we are working on solutions uh, to provide for more stable hosting for, for things like assets and to make that uh, process uh, more manageable. So for instance, right now, if you want to have an avatar, uh, a custom avatar, you actually have to upload it somewhere. Right, so uh, uh, we have a website, we have a Discord, we have Matrix, we have Mastodon. Yeah, we have in-world events on a calendar. And we are very much looking uh, forward to working with people. We are looking in Mac developers, Android developers. We could still use, of course, more C++ developers, artists, testers, whoever wants to join. Okay, let's see. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, on Monday, I plan to do a more technical talk, basically going into details uh, uh, about how do you actually do something with this. How do you create an object or write a script or host a server? So yeah, that's going to be right tomorrow in the morning. Oop. Yeah, right, that's about it. Mm -hmm. right. Questions? Yep. Please remember to repeat the question before you want to. Uh-huh. OK. Uh, if I want to run a server, what are the minimum resources that I will need? Uh, de depends uh, on. Yeah, uh, yeah, a question about uh, minimum resources required to run a server. Uh, so that depends a lot on basically what you want to do with it. But uh, something like uh, the, even the most minimal kind of $5 digital ocean droplet is enough to run a basic server. If you want to have a big party there, you probably will need to scale it up a little bit. But you can actually scale it up t temporarily. Uh, so most services these days, if you uh, say, say, for instance, Linode or DigitalOcean, if you don't touch the size of the uh, disk image, you can actually downscale. So you can just could just upscale for your event and downscale afterwards. That will do fine. Uh, yeah, uh, the technology has been tested to I think something like a thousand people in the same uh, environment. Uh, this is obviously going to take a lot of work. Uh, first, of course, you, you have to make sure that you have the CPU horsepower and bandwidth to actually service that many people. Uh, second, you'll have to organize the world somehow because, I mean, even you, if you can get a thousand people into the same place, uh, they're just going to talk over each other. So, yeah, you need, need to design some sort of environment where that's actually kind of some sort of uh, useful thing can be done in that uh, kind of scenario. Yeah, more questions? Yeah, OK, again. Uh, you're using Opus, so likely the audio link is in the Ruby for below. Mm -hmm. But uh, what about graphics? Uh, what do you mean? Latency. To... Ah, yeah, question about uh, yeah, latency and the graphics. So yes, of course, it depends a lot on where the actual server is hosted. Like if you're hosted in Australia, it's obviously going to have a latency to it. Uh, but in, in general, uh, things are pretty good. It, it depends heavily, on again, on what you want to do with it. Like if you want to script a first-person shooter, you probably should host it somewhere nearby. Mm -hmm. If you just want to talk, well, it's uh, even a bit of latency is perfectly tolerable for people hanging around. Like if you just have a chat environment and people just uh, sitting around a virtual campfire or something, well, latency doesn't matter actually very much. Uh, and what about uh, the introduction of Flack? Will it impact uh, much latency for audio? Uh, question about flag uh, latency for audio. Uh, we uh, don't have flag implemented yet. It's in the planning. Uh, basically, we're kind of, uh, but I don't expect it will be very much. Uh, the, po the point of flag is basically to provide an uh, alternative to Opus because Opus is fairly CPU heavy. So for the times where you don't have a lot of CPU but do have some bandwidth to spare, 
you might actually want to switch to something like Flag. Uh, there's a PR already can, in progress uh, to have um, control over the audio codecs by, uh, with a scripting engine. So right now, the, the client automatically negotiates that. But you could uh, easily have a system where the, the actual, an actual script running in the system uh, decides who uses what codec and in what conditions. So yeah, you can, you can also control the bitrate of the uh, Opus encoder dynamically as well. So you can choose your audio quality if you want. Uh, by default, by the way, we run at 128K. So we are perfectly good for music. Yeah, yep. Uh, just continuing with the audio codec in the audio mixer, you are not you are talking on um, so the audio is raw in that in that part of the system. So it has already been decompressed and will be compressed again to send back to the users. Yeah, a uh, question about uh, audio compression and decompression. Yes, the audio uh, comes from the from the user encoded in whatever codec. Uh, negotiated bef between the client and server. The server uh, will then decode it and encode it back for the people that uh, want to hear it. Uh, so yeah, that's all negotiable, uh, can be negotiated. So you can have a user, for instance, with a high quality co uh, connection, sending 256K audio to the server, and then the server del delivers, for instance, uh, 64k to a user with a lower bandwidth connection because that's what they, they it negotiated. Uh, coming from the second life world, what I used to be, uh, there is actually a, quite um, a big community of researchers about uh, interaction with second life and uh, a couple of conferences uh, mm -hmm. this year. Uh, are you in connection? Uh, um, yeah, question about uh, if we're in connection with Second Life conferences. Uh, not a whole lot. We do have one uh, committee member that is uh, part of the OpenSIM team. So, uh, but uh, this is technically not compatible with Second Life. It's a completely different technology. So, we, yeah. Well, well my, my question is not about the technology. Yeah. But th those conferences are about user interaction yeah. and the fact of using VR mm -hmm. to interact in those environments and the study. Well, it's most about the interpersonal relations mm -hmm. that you can have or can't have while using this. And I think uh, your project could be a, a good addition in that, in that discussion because they shouldn't be talking about just one technology. They should be analyzing uh, everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not, this was not really a question, but a suggestion. Yeah. I do have a question is, uh, have you seen what is your opinion about the, another project, which is Third Room, which is uh, tied with uh, the Matrix? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've seen Third Room. Actually, it was a very interesting uh, talk about, the, about it on FOSDEM, which I attended. Uh, we spoke to some of the matrix uh, developers, and yeah, we uh, we have discussed internally uh, the option of uh, trying to cooperate with uh, the matrix developers and see what comes out of that. Uh, the third room uh, project uh, lo looks uh, very good, but. Uh, yeah, basically we're at the stage where we have to see what's going to happen regarding that. It's uh, still a question of uh, getting together and figuring something out. Uh, but in general, we, we are open, we support open standards, so we expect that we can exchange some technology and some connections. Uh, it, uh, one possibility would be actually to uh, try to connect both systems together. Like we could, for instance, write a client that mirrors things uh, back and forth between different sites and uh, creates a channel, an ability for users of both systems to communicate with each other, for instance. Yeah? Uh, from what I remember from 
high fidelity, and this might have changes a bit, but high fidelity is highly tied uh, with the representation of objects. And by that I mean that ob 3D objects are uh, as they are rendered and streamed to the, to the clients. Uh, so, for instance, if you want to have a different client, a 2D client, or uh, even a textual client, a web client, whatever, you you can't you can't really show what you don't really have a meaning of what you want to show. You you have already the object rendered. I'm not sure if this is still the case with, with your project currently, but if it is, then I wonder how do you see possible to, for instance, now we gave a, a, a great example of this, which is how can you connect uh, this world with other worlds or overt mm. servers with other networks, other metaverses, mm -hmm. or whatever, because I mean, you, you, you don't have a, a, a represent, you, you have already the objects rendered, right? You don't have a, a description of, of how they should be seen by different clients or in different networks. I'm not sure if my question is making uh -huh. sense. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, the, the question is about how. <laughs> Okay, an example is the server doesn't see, doesn't say to the client, here's an elephant of X size. It, mm -hmm. it shows the rendered image of an elephant, right? But on, on the different client, if it doesn't know it is an elephant, it just knows that it is this image that is coming, mm -hmm. then it's, it's going to be hard to translate to uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, a question about, uh, yeah, uh, like uh, how could different types of clients, for instance, a te text client represent this sort of world uh, when we mostly work with 3D data? Yeah, so we have considered this actually. Uh, there's been, there's been a, already been a bit of planning around it. But basically, for instance, one thing we've noticed is that uh, uh, the default worlds, for instance, are too heavy for the Quest. I mean, the standalone stand Quest, for instance, or Android clients, or things like that. Uh, so, what? Uh, uh, well, you can uh, in in this technology, uh, you typically point uh, users not at the actual asset, uh, which uh, we work mostly with FST and GLTF. Uh, but, uh, uh, sorry, FBX and, this, uh, and GLDF. But there's also a metadata file, uh, which is uh, called an FST file. And in this metadata file, you can do c certain things like uh, de defining uh, flexible parts of, uh, yeah, uh, of an object or defining which bones correspond to w w which things. So this could uh, be used also to add metadata, like descriptions, and uh, the client ident identifies itself. So, it's, for instance, it's very much possible to serve a lower quality object to a mobile client, for instance. So, yeah, we could uh, very much uh, do something like uh, having an, a setting that's actually uh, tuned to uh, be e easily parsable by a uh, for instance, a text client, because, for instance, somebody just included a, a bunch of descriptions in, in the metadata. But this is uh, up to the people building the world. You can actually always build something that uh, most people can't use. And we've actually kind of d done that for fun. Like, I mean, no, no, nothing stops you from uh, making a world that re requires the very latest uh, video card and 64 gigabytes of memory. You just uh, load a bunch of stuff on it and it's going to happen. Uh, so yeah, <clears throat> we have uh, even considered uh, doing a um, proxy service, which would be basically kind of a, like a web proxy that 
uh, in, comes in between the as, uh, the server uh, serving the asset and the client and shrinks it down. So basically, a uh, mobile client would have uh, a bit of a help from another service, uh, shrinking down textures and reformatting assets uh, to avoid overloading it, for instance. That's really great. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a totally different question, which is regarding privacy. And if that is any concern at all to you guys, uh, and what are you thinking about it? Uh, and I'm, to give an example, <laughs> um, with audio as it is right now, it means that the server has access to everything. There's no point-to-point -point conversation. Mm -hmm. there, there's no private conversation between users without the server also being involved, as an extreme example. I'm not sure if is this a concern, if it's considered by designer that's it. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you? Yeah. So a question about the privacy, and especially in regards to the audio server uh, being able to uh, hear everything. Uh, so um, it's yeah, we recognize it's a bit of a potential issue. Uh, basically, we make it very very easy for you to actually set up your own private server. Um, you can even host a server on your local machine. Uh, so there's a mechanism for hole punching in, in the system. So you could just uh, install the server on your laptop, uh, run it right from there, invite another person over, lock it down. You, you can just uh, set up uh, an access uh, password to, to the thing and have your pr private conversation there. Uh, yeah, I think that's a more or less the current most viable uh, way to do that. Uh, yeah, about that, the amount of security in the system currently isn't very high, which is by the mean we don't have very rich access rules or access permissions or, or things like that. Uh, it was designed as a kind of very open system without uh, a lot of... Uh, Controls like you might have, for instance, in Second Life, because Second Life is a centralized system, so it had to t tackle that. In our case, you, you, you can just uh, set up your own s separate environment and just invite whoever you want to have it in, into it. But yeah, I think this will definitely need to improve in, on the long term. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yeah. How is your relation with Holtec regarding the the QT license, which is also a problem with KDE. Well, uh, really, uh, pro uh, question about the QT license. Uh, well, more or less the same thing as with the KDE. We, we rely on that, uh, yeah, it's, uh, there's an open license uh, available. Um, QT is very deeply uh, used in, in the code. So I think getting rid of it is not really kind of viable at present. Uh, it's used for pretty much every, everything, including the interface, the scripting engine, and even in many parts of, of the code where it possibly doesn't quite belong. Uh, like, uh, I think parts of, even of the rendering engine just use Qt classes because that's what the original developers did uh, originally. Uh, but yeah, um, I think uh, Worst case, we could just uh, uh, keep uh, using old versions, I suppose. Uh, I think uh, Qt is unlikely to kind of uh, um, be that much of a problem because it's a very uh, used library that many other people use and man maintain. So even we have to remain on a Qt version for a very long time, uh, we do expect that other people will also be interested, and uh, yeah, we can count on a bit of help in that regard. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you said that uh, you are going to migrate to V8. Uh, V8 directly, or something like Qt Web Engine as a Qt component to implement mm -hmm. So, yeah, question about migration to V8. So, yeah, we are migrating to V8. 
and we've written a Qt to V8 adapt adaptation layer. So yeah, that's actually a thing that we might want to outsource eventually. So the, uh, basically, uh, so uh, Qt script, uh, the original scripting engine was deprecated. And uh, uh, Qt6 includes a replacement for that, but we didn't find it suitable for our needs. It's uh, been too kind of too simplified. It lacks the features we actually need uh, uh, to, to make things work. Uh, we've researched it a little bit, and it turned out that Qt did consider, it, consider uh, trying to integrate V8 at one point and basically gave up on it. Uh, so yeah, we looked uh, for options, and the, in the end, for us, uh, the V8 seemed to like the best uh, option anyway. So we went and did it, and it almost completely works at this point. I mean, it's currently not stable, but uh, yeah, it compiles, it runs scripts. Uh, the interface currently launches with the Q Qt, mm, yeah, sorry, with the V8 engine. So one of the things we considered is trying to outsource that, basically going, OK, so we've written this layer, but perhaps somebody else will find it useful. Maybe we could spin it off to a, to a separate library and make it kind of be a separate project, and somebody else will be interested in it. So whatever we missed, uh, or uh, whether in functionality or bugs, perhaps other people could, could also contribute to it. Just, yeah, take it out of our code base and have it be its own thing. I'm wondering if we want to end the session and then maybe mm -hmm. just a few bucks later or not. Yeah. Or what, is everyone interested? I think we're ready to take a break, yeah? Okay. What do you want to do? Sorry. Great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. Welcome.